Well, good morning. I will not be speaking in the Portuguese language. I will be speaking in the Page County language, which may be just as hard to translate. I don't know. So being in supply chain um, and in distribution, you know, everything is all about efficiency and, and how you can do things um, better, faster, how you can look for ways to touch cartons less. And so we have this thing that, uh, and it's pretty widely known throughout the manufacturing supply chain world, it's called Lean Six Sigma, and it's this way of trying to identify processes that aren't efficient, and it's a way of trying to identify root cause of issues. And one of the ways that they use is this thing called Five Whys. Five Whys, W-H-Y-S, not Five Wives. That's a different religion altogether. Five Whys. And so basically what you do is you continue to ask why until you can get down to the root cause of whatever the issue is. I'll give you an example. This is a true example, and it happened not far from us in Washington, D.C. Chunks of concrete from the Jefferson Memorial were beginning to, to break down and fall, and actually they almost hit a tourist that was in D.C. And so um, as they do in D.C., they got a committee together, and they said, well, let's figure out why these chunks of concrete are falling off of the Jefferson Memorial. So they brought in a chemist, and the chemist determined that the, the soap, the hard soap that they were using to pressure wash the Jefferson Memorial every two weeks was mixing with jet fumes from planes that were taking off and landing from Reagan National, and it was causing the concrete to break down. They said, well, why are they washing the Jefferson Memorial every two weeks? And they said, well, it's because of all the pigeons that are congregating at the Jefferson Memorial and leaving their deposits. And so they brought in a pigeon expert. Why are there so many pigeons? And the pigeon expert determined that the pigeons were there to feed on all of these spiders. So why are there so many spiders? So they brought in a spider expert. This is your tax dollars at work, folks. They brought in a spider expert. And the spider expert determined that the spiders were there feeding on these little insects called midges. And so a, a midge is this little sand fly that lives around water, and they come out at dusk, and they have this really short reproductive cycle, and they, they come out at dusk, you know, they, they live out their reproductive cycle, and they die, and then they fall to the floor, and all the spiders were coming to eat on the midges. Well, why were there so many midges? Well, they were drawn by the lights that were turned on at the Jefferson Memorial. So what they determined to do was to reduce the lights by one hour in their programming so that they weren't on as long during dusk, and that reduced the midges, and then that reduced the spiders and the pigeons, and now the problem is solved. Pretty crazy, huh? The other option was to move the airport, I guess. And so I'm going to try to attempt to use sort of the same methodology today to talk about a really big problem that we all have. We all struggle with it. And we see its devastating effects in our world today, and that is sin. Like, have you ever thought, have you ever struggled with why you sin? Like, I don't know if, if you're like me, but, man, like, you do something, and as me, as immediately when you do it, you're like, man, I knew I shouldn't have done that. You get in an argument, and you say something unkind to, like, your spouse or your child or somebody that you care about, and, and as the words are still hanging in the air, and you're like, man, I knew I shouldn't have said that. Or you see somebody that's, that's in need and you don't take steps, you know you can help meet their need and you, you do nothing about it and you're like, ah, it's just going to take too much time or it's going to be too expensive or whatever. And, and then, you know, immediately you're like, man, I just, I know I should have done that and I didn't do it. Any of you ever struggle with that? You're, we're not the first ones to struggle with that. Matter of fact, the uh, Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 7, 15 through 20. I love his honesty. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. And that is good. In other words, I don't want to obey the law, but when I do, then that's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul here is talking about, you know, he's had this 
progression and now he has the Holy Spirit living inside of him and now when he does what he doesn't want to do he knows that that's not his nature that it's sin and I can I can relate to Paul in this verse I don't know about you and so what we're going to do is we're going to ask some questions today as we talk as we approach the subject and the title of our master class today is sin 101 and I think it's really really important for us to understand the root cause of our sin because if we don't really understand why we sin and what what's at the very core of it it's going to be really hard for us to figure out how we practically deal with it and live this life that Jesus calls us to live every single day and so we're going to ask some questions today it won't be five whys but we're going to ask pretty major questions we're going to ask a whole lot of other questions but there's four questions we're going to kind of park on today number one what is sin you may be sitting here like well that you know that's kind of a no-brainer well let's we're going to define it in the simplest terms we can what is sin the second question we're going to ask and we're going to spend honestly most of our time this morning on the second question because i think it's so pivotal it's so critical to us living the life that jesus calls us to live why do we sin the third question we're going to look at this morning is, what does Jesus have to say about sin? Again, the master class, Jesus before Google, right? What does Jesus have to say about sin? And then the fourth thing we're going to look at is, what do we do about our sin? What options do we have? Let's pray and then we'll jump in. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we come to you this morning. And we know that this is something that affects every single person in this room. And Lord, the goal this morning is not for us to beat ourselves up about it. The goal this morning is, is not for us to, to point fingers. The goal for us is, is to not get, get lulled or, or drug into this, this guilting of our sin. But Lord, the goal this morning is for us to be free from it. And we know that you give us the power to have freedom over our sin. And, and so Lord, as we look at, at your word this morning, may you just reveal to us the things inside of us and the things that we do that we know are not according to your will. It's not how you designed us. And God, we just ask that you would give us the power to surrender to you, that your Holy Spirit would set us free from those things in our lives. All because of who you are and also that you can be glorified in us. We ask it in your name. Amen. So let's first uh, answer this question. What is sin? first time we see the word sin show up in the Bible is in Genesis 4. Now, sin happened before that, but the first time we see the very word sin used is in Genesis 4. And here it is. It's this Hebrew word, kata. Kind of sounds cool like when you used to reenact like Bruce Lee movies. Kata, right? Kata. And in the Greek in the New Testament, it's hamartia. And it really means this. It means to miss the goal. You may have heard it described as miss the mark. And the way it's used um, is exactly that. Matter of fact, in Judges 20, it talks about a group of men from the tribe of Benjamin, and they were so skilled with a slingshot that they could sling a rock at a hare and not kata, not miss. It also means to wander from the path of uprightness and honor. And if you think about it, that makes sense because how many times do we see the word path used throughout Scripture? Thy word is a, light and, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. And as a matter of fact, in, in uh, Proverbs 19, it talks about if, if you make a hasty decision, you may kata your destination. You may miss your destination wherever it is that you hoped you were going. And so we look at this and say, okay, well, it means to miss the goal, but what is the goal? Right? What's the goal? Well, the goal is for us to live our lives the way that God created us and the way God designed us. Well, then you ask, well, how did God design us? Well, he designed us in his own image. Well, what is the image of God? Well, we know, think about the char characteristics of God. We know that God is love. We know that God is faithful that we know that God is unlike we just said only a holy God God is different from every other God he desires a relationship with him who else what other God would would have him call a, have us call him father right he desires a relationship with us and he desires us to love one another the way that he loves us he desires us to love and honor him and to love and honor others that's the characteristics of God 
And so essentially sin is this. Anytime we fail to properly love God and properly honor God, and anytime we fail to love one another the way that God commands us to love one another, and anytime we fail to honor one another as image bearers of God, other people also created in the image of God, then we miss the goal we set. And if you think, wow, that is it really that simple? It is, but it's also that hard. I mean, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Teacher, they're trying to trap him, right? Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus said it right here. All of the law, the fulfillment of all the laws and all the prophets hang on these two commandments, love God and love others. Period. Those are the greats. And when we fail to do that, we sin. And so now that we know what sin is, we get into this really, really, really important question. Why do we sin? Like, have you ever asked yourself that question? Why do I sin? If you're like me, and, and you probably heard it in many sermons, or maybe it's how you grew up, you know, people say, well, why do I sin? Well, I'm just, you know, it's my flesh. It's my sin nature. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I don't want to trivialize any of that, but it's much deeper. We are not just sinners saved by grace. God called us to a much bigger life than that. Yes, He came and He became sin for us and He died in our place and He paid the penalty for our sin and we get His righteousness as a result of that. But He called us to live this life that has the quality of eternity not being mastered by sin, but every day loving others the way He commands us to do, loving our God the way He commands us to do. That's what He calls us to be. It's not just, oh, well, I'm a sinner and I'm saved and one day I'll go to heaven. No, that's not what He calls us to do. He calls us to a much bigger life, this uncommon life that we preached about, so that we can live that life in His kingdom on this earth right now, free from sin. So, like, why do we sin? Well, for us to answer this question, we have to go back to where it all began, in Genesis 3. Now, I know probably everybody in this room knows this story in some form or fashion. Maybe it's just an image, you know, of a woman next to a tree, an apple tree with a snake in it. Or maybe it's, you know, a much deeper theological understanding of it. Probably most of you in this room have read this story hundreds of times. Many of you have probably taught this story dozens of times. I'm going to ask you as we read through it this morning to try and forget about everything you know about the story in Genesis 3. And I'm going to ask you to try to look at it in a new light. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to wrestle with the text. There are some things in this story that are just kind of odd, quite frankly. And we're going to ask a lot of questions about it. So as we go through it, try to open your mind up and forget what it is that you've already learned about this. So Genesis 3. Um, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, let's think about some things in here that are just kind of odd. First thing we see, there's a serpent, and the serpent is walking and talking. Kind of weird, right? I mean, that's really even hard for us to imagine because it's really difficult for us to imagine a serpent as anything else other than a scaly creature that crawls around on the ground, right? We don't know what the serpent looked like, but it was a beast of the field. Right and Eve, which is the other weird thing. Like, it doesn't say, and the serpent spaketh unto Eve, and she was sore afraid. Like, it doesn't say that, right? There's no indication that she was suppressed. Now, does that mean animals talked before the fall? I don't know. We know that Satan is behind this, or rather he is speaking through the serpent. We don't know. But we know there's a walking, talking serpent, and Eve doesn't seem to be too distressed by that. So we think, well, 
What's the angle? Why is this serpent walking and talking? And why is the serpent particularly interested in talking to Eve? And we're not going to turn back there, but we're gonna, I'm going to give you the context behind some of this in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, when the Lord created Adam, he put Adam in the garden. He gave Adam the command not to eat from the tree of knowledge. You eat from all the other trees, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Puts him in the garden, and then the Lord says, it's not good for man to be what? Alone. It's not good for man to be alone. And so what's the very next thing God does? Most people, when you ask that question, say, well, he made Eve. But that's not the next thing he did. The next thing he did was parade all of his creation in front of Adam. All of the beasts of the field, all of the livestock, all of the birds of the air. He paraded them in front of Adam, and he said, Adam, you have a job. I want you to name every single one of them, and then I want you to look at all of these animals and see if you can find a suitable helper, a suitable companion. And Adam did it just as the Lord had commanded, and then it says in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 2 that no suitable companion or helper was found. Now, that's a little odd. Like, do you really think the Lord thought that Adam was going to find, like, a suitable helper among the animals? Like, did you think he was going to find, like, some gazelle to cozy up with? No, the Lord knew better. But the Lord was teaching Adam a lesson, and here's what he was teaching him. Adam, you're not an animal. You're not an animal. You're different. You're created in my image. And, and... Because he said it's not good for man to be alone. Sometimes when we feel lonely, we look for companionship and solace where we ought not to look for it. And he's teaching Adam that quite, he's teaching Adam that very, very hard lesson. You're not an animal. And so then the very next thing he does is creates Eve. And that's why Adam says, ah, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, somebody that looks like me. Hubba hubba, great job, Lord. Right? There's this beautiful woman that he's created and so what's the serpent's problem well guess what the serpent would have been paraded in front of Adam named by Adam and rejected by Adam and so the serpent is going to Eve like who do you think you are like why do you think you're better than me that's kind of the intent here like why do you get to be a companion why does God see you as worthy and not me so he goes after Eve that's who he's going to right and so he's talking to Eve and then he starts to get Eve to think about this and notice what she does here is the command that the Lord gave Adam in Genesis 2 16 through 17 and the Lord God commanded the man saying you may surely eat of every tree your translation may say eat yes eat surely eat of every tree of the garden but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you will surely die. That was the Lord's command. Now look at Eve's recollection of the Lord's command. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Very different from what the Lord actually commanded. And I want to show you some of the differences in what the Lord said and what Eve said. The Lord said, the tree of life is in the middle of the garden. If you go back and look at Genesis 2, when he created the garden, he said, the tree of life is in the midst of the garden. He doesn't say the tree of knowledge is in the middle of the garden. And the way the Hebrew is written, he's only referring to the tree of life. What does Eve do? She puts the tree of knowledge in the middle of the garden. Why would she do that? Because she wanted it. And don't we do that? We want something, it becomes our focus, it becomes, you know, the center of what we're after, and that's what Eve is doing here. And then it says, the Lord said, don't eat from the tree. What does Eve do? She's like, hey, we can't even touch the fruit. The Lord never said you couldn't touch the fruit. He never said that. So why is Eve adding that? Well, because if we can make one of God's commands seem so unrealistic that any reasonable person wouldn't disagree with us disobeying it, then we feel a whole lot better about not doing what he said, don't we? And then he says, you will sh it's a forbidden tree. The Lord says the whole tree is forbidden. What does Eve say? Well, it's just the fruit. The Lord's like, put caution tape around it, stay away from the tree, don't even get close to the tree. And then Eve's like, well, I can get a little bit cl just close enough maybe to see the fruit. And the Lord says, you will surely die. 
And Eve says, lest you die. And the word lest here means for fear of. I might die. There's a chance. There's fear of me dying. When the Lord said, you will surely die. And the Lord says, eat, yes, eat of every tree. In other words, I am giving you abundant food. Like the most weak probably can't even imagine what those trees look like and what that fruit looked like because it was before the fall. But I am giving you like this smorgasbord of fruit, this amazing fruit. You can eat of all of it. It's just one tree I'm telling you not to. And, and she takes the abundance of God and she minimizes it and says, yeah, we can eat of the fruit of the trees. She removes the double language and all that God has promised to her. And then there is this strange progression that happens in Eve's mind. Verse 6 of Genesis 3 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. See the progression here? First she sees the tree like, oh, that looks like good food. Let me get a little closer. Oh, man, that's a delight. That is beautiful fruit. And she's drawn in even more to the point where it says she desired it. And this word is critical to our understanding of why we sin. This word, desire. She desired it. And the serpent knows she desires it. That's what he's capitalizing on. She desires this fruit. And I've heard people say, you know, when I get to heaven one day, I'm going to ask Eve, what were you thinking? Like, what in the world? And, and for me, I'm going to ask Adam, because he's standing right there and never says a word. Right? Typical man. Standing right there and not saying, like, Adam, why didn't you say anything? And maybe Adam's like, happy wife, happy life. I don't know. But he never says a word. And then he also takes to the fruit. So how did the serpent get her here? Well, let's go see what the serpent said. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? I underline any, because as every time I had heard this story for years and years and decades, I always put the emphasis on any. Did God really say you shouldn't eat from any tree? But that's not how it is written. That's not how the inspired word of God Cause this to be written down. In its original language, the emphasis on said. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And we sit here, we're like, well, of course he said it. We just read the command, right? He very clearly said, don't eat of the tree. Here's what the serpent's saying. Eve, don't you desire it? Isn't there a voice inside of you that says, eat of that fruit? The serpent isn't necessarily challenging the authority of God. What he's saying is the spoken word of God is not necessarily what you should pay attention to. Isn't there a voice inside of you that says, go do this and go eat of that fruit? Didn't God give you that voice, Eve? Didn't he create you? Go ahead, Eve. You're an animal just like me. She fell for it. Adam fell for it. And if you think about that word desire, you think about how we are different than animals. Most people would say, well, we're different from animals because we can walk and talk. Well, the serpent was walking and talking and making some really good arguments, wasn't he? Really crafty arguments. So what makes us different from animals? Well, we were created in the image of God, right? Animals weren't. And so one of the things that, about God that is that different is that our God knows how, he knows how and when to say enough. He created creation and he said, it is good. I'm done. It's perfect. I'm going to rest. Animals don't know that. Animals can't control their desires. We were created in the image of God. He created us to be able to control that desire and not listen to those voices. And I'll illustrate it for you. Several years ago, we went to um, Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg, and we went horseback riding, trail riding. My wife's like, man, that was fun. We should get some horses. Because she starts talking to the lady, 
He's like, how do you get your horses? Like, oh, we go to a coal sale, and we get them really cheap. And he's like, hey, they're cheap. We get cheap horses. And there's such thing as a cheap horse. I'm here to tell you right now. And so through the help of a precious lady in our church, we actually found a couple that we wanted to get rid of two Tennessee walkers. They just wanted to find a good home for them. And so we get these two horses, Sport and Magic. And, you know, we're going to ride them. We're going to saddle them up, Aaron. We're going to ride through the field as the sun's going down over the Massanut Mountains holding hands. It's going to be great. I think we've ridden those horses once in the last two years. And the last time Amy got on it, she got thrown off. And so guess what these two horses, Sport and Magic, are doing? Almost every time I look out the window or go outside, here's what they're doing. Head down, eating grass. Why? Because that's the way they were designed. That's what they desire to do. Eat. They are fulfilling their design from their creator. I mean, could you imagine how silly it would be for one of the horses to say, well, it's getting warm. It's almost bathing suit weather. I'm going to have to slip into that bathing suit, and I put on some LBs over the winter. So I'm going to run around the paddock for 30 minutes every day, and then I'm going to do some intermittent fasting. And so I can lose some weight. Like, that's silly, right? You expect a horse just to eat because that's what they were designed to do. They are listening to their desire. As a matter of fact, when you look in the New Testament and you see the word flesh or fleshly desires or carnal, it's translated from the Greek word sarx and it means animal appetite. What it means. Listen to our fleshly desires. We are listening to our animal appetites. As a matter of fact, yesterday when I was going from the barn to get hay for, you know, the two horses that we never ride off into the sunset, I was coming through the field, and I look over, and my father-in-law's bull, Vegas, is in Micah's backyard. That's not where he belongs. He belongs in the field. But he's in Micah's backyard. Why is he in Micah's backyard? Because he desired the grass in Micah's backyard over the grass in the field. And I started thinking about a bull, and I started thinking about this message. What is a bull designed to do? A bull is designed to increase the herd, right? That's its design. Could you imagine a bull say, man, I'm going to delete all my social media. I'm just going to take a break from dating. I'm just, I'm going to go somewhere else in another pen until the Lord gives me the heifer he has for me, right? Like, it's not, he's not going to do that. That's silly. We expect a bull to do what a bull is designed to do, and if a bull doesn't, you say, that is a useless bull. Right, right, Jerry? You'd get rid of it, make hamburger out of it, whatever. You would get rid of the bull because it is following its animal appetites. We're different not supposed to follow our animal appetites that's what eve did she listened to that voice inside of her she took the bait said i desire it man i had this voice this strong desire this voice inside of me yeah maybe god did give me that i'll listen to that voice and i'll go eat of it when adam and eve ate of the fruit they chose their desire over their design they chose their desire over their design. And you may be sitting here this morning and you may be saying, hey, look, I'm, I hear you, Aaron, but like, I'm not, I don't have these strong desires, these lustful desires to go and have something or do something or, or you know, own something. I don't, I don't have those strong desires, but I'm going to tell you right now. Remember it said the serpent was craftier than any other beast of the field? It doesn't come like that. Sometimes that desire is very subtle and you don't even know it's there. How many of you in here struggle with anger? Three people. How many of you in here struggle with honesty? Everybody else that didn't raise their hand. We have a desire to be in control, and we have a desire that people do things the way we think they ought to do, and they say things the way we think they ought to say them, and they behave the way we think they should behave. And we desire it so much that it becomes an expectation that we have for them and they don't even know we have the expectation. And then when they don't live up to the expectation that we have put on them, we take it personally and we respond in this emotion called anger. See how subtle that was? This desire is inside of us and we might not even realize it. How many of you struggle with road rage? Oh, more people raise their hand now because that's not anger. I, I do. I'm going to tell you, the worst part of my drive is from Front Royal to Luray on 340. Yeah, 55 miles an hour, which everybody knows means 62 miles an hour. Sorry, police officers. 
seven miles over is fast enough to get you there quicker and not get you a ticket in the process, most likely, right? Seven miles over. Man, it's Friday evening, and I just want to get home and get my weekend started. And, I, you know, out of Front Royal, things are going so well. Cruising along, pop over the hill. There's somebody going 50 miles an hour. Some of you just got tense right there when I said that. Some of you just got tense. And you're like, maybe they don't see me, so I'll get a little closer, right? They're still not speeding up. So you do one of these, like, you know, peek out, hey, I'm back here, I'm back here. Maybe you flash your lights. And then, of course, nothing's been coming the whole time, and there's only, like, what, five passing zones between Front Royal and Luray. And you get to the first one, there's, like, 11 cars coming the other way. So you're like, man, is it, like, National Morons Day out on the road? What's the problem? And so then, you know, you get like four miles from home, like that last passing zone, and nobody's coming. You pull out, and you slam on the gas so they can hear your engine roar when you go by, right? And you look over, and you give them the disapproving look. Y'all know that look, that disapproving look? And you look over, and you realize it's your sister-in-law, Renee Grandstaff. (laughs) Some of you have never gotten behind her on 340. But 50 is her max, I'm going to tell you right now. But we get mad because we desire for people to drive a certain way. We desire people to drive a certain speed. We desire them to pull over. When we do. That's, that's what it comes from. Sometimes we desire to be esteemed more highly than somebody else or more favorably than somebody else. And that can drive us to be critical of them. It can drive us to treat them poorly. It can drive us to gossip about them. It can got, drive us to slander them. Sometimes we desire to build our own empire and amass our own wealth, and it causes us to be selfish and use people for our own personal gain. See, those desires, those animal appetites are there, and we just don't realize it. And that's why it's so critical that we understand and we think about this question when we do things. Church, which voice are you listening to? Which voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the spoken word of God, or are you listening to that desire? that voice inside of you. Next question. Question number three. What does Jesus have to say about sin? Honestly, he doesn't say a whole lot. There are thousands of references to sin in the Bible, but Jesus doesn't say a ton about it. Here's what Jesus doesn't say about sin. He doesn't say, you bunch of filthy sinners. You bunch of lowlifes. He doesn't say that. But I want to look at John 8 this morning. And especially this verse in John 8, verse 34. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Practices sin. I'm pretty good at practicing sin. I don't know about you. But the word practice, poieo, in Greek, also means to produce or to bear. And it's the same word Jesus uses in Matthew 5 when he's talking about the fruit of the tree. That's kind of ironic. He's talking about fruits and trees, right? He says, you will know them by their fruit. A good tree cannot produce poieo, bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce poieo, produce good fruit. It's the same idea. And what he's saying here is everyone who is producing sin in their lives... Everyone who is producing sin in their lives, they're living this lifestyle where that's the fruit that they produce. Well, there's only one conclusion we can draw from that. They must be a slave to sin. They must be a slave. Sin is their master, if that's the kind of life that they're living. What else does Jesus have to say about sin? Well, earlier in John chapter 8, we all know the story of the woman caught in adultery. She's been drugged out of the bed, drugged for the religious leaders. And we all know that they said, hey, Jesus, you know, the, the law says that she should be stoned. And Jesus said, well, whoever's innocent, go ahead and throw the first stone. And he bends back down. He starts writing in the dirt. Some people think he was actually drawing out the sins of all the Pharisees. I don't, we don't know what he was doing. But here's what, Jesus has said, here's what Jesus says to her. He stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? No one condemned you? She said, no, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Gosh, think about it. And then he says, go, and from now on, sin no more. And you're like, well, that's impossible. I'm going to go sin. But that's not what, here's what he's saying. He's saying, stop listening to your animal appetites. Stop listening to your desires. Go and live a life 
that desires me, that desires a relationship with me, live a different kind of life, not one mastered by sin, but one surrendered to me, loving others the way I've commanded you, forgiving others, valuing others, honoring others, other people as image bearers of God. Go choose that lifestyle. Stop living the lifestyle you've been living. It didn't work out for you. As a matter of fact, if I wouldn't have stepped in, you'd be dead by now. It's very similar to this verse in Genesis 4. Remember I told you that sin shows up for the first time in Genesis 4, and this is it. This is after Cain's offering was rejected and Abel's was accepted and Cain was angry. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Man, could you imagine a more powerful illustration than the Lord gives right now of sin? This beast that is crouching at the door, ready to devour. It's this, hey, sin, this, this lifestyle of you just listening to your animal appetite, to your fleshly desire, this lifestyle is ready to pounce on you. And then see what he says? Its desire is contrary to you. Its desire is for you. It wants to consume you. But you must rule over it. Jesus says, go and sin no more. The Lord here tells Cain, you've got to rule over it. He would not call us to do something if he wasn't going to equip us to rule over it. And because of the finished work of Christ and because of his death, burial, and resurrection and who he was and that he became sin for us, when, when we put our faith and trust in him, we accept that gift of righteousness. When we surrender to him, make him Lord over our life, the Holy Spirit lives in us and it gives us the power to rule over our sin and not let it be our so we looked at what Jesus says about sin. You know, what did he do about our sins? Because what he did about our sins shouts throughout all eternity. And there are so many scriptures that talk about what he did about our sins, but I just want to look at four this morning because I think they're really powerful. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest. It was seen among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin, the payment. He became sin so that his blood would pay our penalty, our cost. Corinthians 5.21, we just sang this this morning. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, that's key, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was tempted the same way Eve was tempted. Hey, are you hungry, Jesus? Why don't you turn these bread? Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Don't you have a desire inside of you to fill your belly? And he didn't do it. He was the only one that lived a sinless life, tempted in every way, tempted to listen to that desire. But he didn't. He ruled over it perfectly. He became our sin. Went to the cross. Paid for our sin. Gives us his righteousness. I love this verse. He himself bore our sins in his body. Here it is again. On the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier. It doesn't say that he bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we can go to heaven. He doesn't say that. He says so that we might die to our sin and live to righteousness. He did what he did so that through him, in him, as we surrender to him, as we abide in him, and through the power of his Holy Spirit, we can master our sin and we are dead to that world in newness of life with a new nature as new creations, and we can live this life he calls us to live of righteousness and how we love one another and how we love God. And then Jesus himself said it in Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the covenant, Poured out for many the forgiveness of sins. He did. What his blood was for. I am so thankful. Not just what Jesus said about sin, but I am eternally grateful for what he did about our sin. That is hope for us this morning, church. And so lastly, what do we do about our sin? We've defined it. We've gotten to the root cause of it. 
We've seen what Jesus had to say about it. We're rejoicing still today, even as we sang this morning, on what Jesus did about our sin. So what do we do about our sin? Well, first thing we need to do is confess it. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In other words, when we live our lives the way Jesus lived his life perfectly for us as a display for this is how you should live your life. When we walk in obedience to him, we have fellowship with one another. In other words, we have right relationship with one another as we do and obey the commands of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive, our, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a God. Confess it. He's faithful and just to forgive us. Because that's what his blood does. And then here's what Jesus says that we need to do about our sin. And, that, and again, back in John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Abide in my word. I am the true vine. Abide in me. Abide in my word. That's what disciples do. Remember, this is master class. It's all about being disciples of the master. And one of the jobs of a disciple is to memorize the words of God, to understand his interpretation of their rabbi, to emulate their rabbi, and then to go and teach others and make disciples of others. And Jesus says, if you do that, if you abide in my word, if you are in my word, if you're memorizing my word, if you're obeying my word, then that is what a disciple looks like. And when you do that, you will know the truth. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to make it apparent to you. And when you mess up, you're going to have conviction. You're going to know immediately that you chose your voice, your desire. You chose falsehood over truth. The problem is our desires, and this is what we see in the world today, we get to define our, the world defines its own truth because it just listens to its animal appetites. I desire to be a different gender. That's my truth. I desire to have pleasure, so I'm going to do whatever it is I want to do. If it feels good, do it. That's my truth. You can't tell me otherwise, right? Jesus says, abide in me and you will know the truth. And you will be set free. Set free from what? Set free from being a slave to sin. You have freedom. And you're like, well, it doesn't really feel like freedom. It's so hard. Absolutely. But when you do it and when you live surrendered to Jesus and you are free from, from the, being a slave to sin and sin being your master, you live this amazing life, this eternal life, this life that has the quality of eternity in his kingdom on this earth. And man, what a blessing. Abide in my word. John 8, 36 says, this is the exclamation point. If the Son sets you free, that's it. If he's your hope, if that's where you surrendered in your life, if that's the central part of your worship, if that's who you are devoted to, you are free, that's it, period. You're free indeed. So, I just want to review our four questions this morning. What is sin? Missing the goal. It's failure to love and honor God the way we should, and it's failure to love and honor others the way we should. Why do we sin? Well, because we listen to our inner voice, our desire. We don't listen to the spoken word of God. It's our animal appetite. What does Jesus have to say about sin? Well, he says, practice sin, if your life is a life full of harvesting sin fruit, then you may be a slave to sin. Then what did he do about sin? Everything. He gave us life so that we could be free. We could have his righteousness. And then what do we do about our sin? Confess it. Abide in Christ. Abide in the words. We can live a life. Him is our master. Not sin as a master. Because this desire thing gets in the way. I want to read to you what one author says about it. He said, this is what happened when Eve gave in to her desire. My desire intrudes and becomes an escapable part of the moral calculus. It's really hard for us because we look through this lens of personal desire, longing, and animal appetite, and that's the way we see it that, hey, if you abide in my word, you'll know the truth. Set you free. 
Romans 8, 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh, animal appetites, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit, surrender to the Spirit, surrender to Christ, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. That really is the question for us this morning, church. Who's your master? Who's your master? Is Jesus your master or is slave your master? If you're sitting here this morning and you're like, I, I'm not sure. There's a lot in my life that's not going well. I know that I'm probably not treating people the way I should. I'm not sure if I've made Jesus my master. I've, Jesus still saves today. Today would be an awesome day for you to come and accept the finished work of Christ, to have his righteousness credited to your account as you put your faith and your trust in him as you receive that gift of salvation and you surrender your life and make him lord over your life today will be an awesome day for you to say the son set me free today for the rest of us what voice are you listening to it just happened to me yesterday i was or friday i was driving home and i had a little road rage and actually right uh when it happened i thought man what voice am I listening to today? That's a good practical reminder for us every day of our lives this week. We do something we know we shouldn't, and we don't do something we know we should. What voice am I listening to? Am I listening to the master? Am I listening to my own? Pray.